Let's open God's Word together to the Old Testament book of Leviticus. That hymn is a beautiful hymn. It was written by one of the previous ministers of Melbourne Hall in Leicester, and a man by the name of Mr. Fullerton. And the closest that Melbourne Hall ever came to revival was under his ministry. He was preaching a gospel meeting one night, and the Spirit of God moved in such a way that a hundred souls were saved in one night. Can you imagine? And uh, God moved in such a way that he told his deacons, he said, shut the doors and stop the people from going out. I feel like saying that sometimes. <laughs> shut the doors and stop the people. Here's what he was saying, stop the people from going to hell. Yeah. And a hundred souls were saved that night. Amazing. And uh, that's, of course, the church where our dear friend, the pastor Paul Bassett, ministered for more than 40 years. I was able to see Mr. Bassett last week. Keep him in your prayers. And I'm hoping that we can see him again here soon, but a dear, dear friend of ours. Let's turn to Leviticus chapter 25, if you would, please. This is a very big weekend in our country. Uh, the Queen's Jubilee, celebrating 70 years of, of royal reigning and quite an accomplishment. Longest reigning monarch that the, this country has ever seen. And uh, quite out, outstanding, you could say. And celebrations everywhere. The word jubilee has come to be associated with celebration. You find that word, we use it for everything. We're going to have a jubilee, a uh, street jubilee. We're going to have this jubilee and that jubilee. But the word itself, the, the word comes from the Bible. Do you know that every dictionary, when you look up the word jubilee in any dictionary, Somewhere, it may be several lines down below, but it'll tell you that the origin of this word jubilee came from the Bible. It can be traced down from when the scriptures were being translated, and uh, obviously originally from Hebrew, then it was originally then translated in Latin and ultimately in English. But that word jubilee has come from the scriptures, and we find it here in Leviticus 25. The word actually means a ram's horn, a trumpet. And so it's, it was in reference this trumpet, this ram's horn was to be blown at special celebrations, and especially at this time, this year of Jubilee. So the year of Jubilee became entitled with the name of a trumpet. It was associated with the blowing of this trumpet. And that's what we've come to here. It's interesting. Uh, God has given to Moses certain instructions for the nation of Israel, and he was teaching them many things. And this is a chapter of Sabbaths. Talks about uh, the first Sabbath we read about there is a, is a day of rest. You know it, don't you? God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. Now, can I just say for a moment, everything in the Old Testament is looking ahead to that which was to come or is to come. And so when you look at things and you sometimes say, what's the big deal about this? And what about this feast and this festival, this tradition, this ritual? It all has a deep meaning. It all has a real deep meaning, but one of the greatest problems in any religion, but one of the greatest problems in even Christianity is when people start going through the motions of religious ritual without knowing what they're doing. Can I say there's a danger of doing that every Sunday when you come here? There's a danger of just coming to the, to the barn, coming to the gathering of the church, because that's what Christians do. There's a danger that you stand up and you sing because that's what we do every week. There's a danger at night when you, when you lay your head on your, on your pillow that you say your little prayer because that's just what we do. And it can become a re religious ritual. But God instituted some things to teach his people some very important truths. And one of the things he instituted was a day of rest. The last, the seventh, the last day of the week. Work six days, man will work six days, rest on the seventh. That's the day of rest. That was the Saturday, the last day of the week, the Sabbath. But that was more than just a day of rest and a legalistic day of rest. It was more than God just saying, don't work on the day of rest. If you do, you're going to drop dead. It was more than that. He knew man's body needed a break. He knew as well that animals needed a break. But he also knew that it would point to something else. We find in the New Testament that Jesus is our Sabbath. That's where we find rest. It points as well to the end of all time. After, as it were, six days of labor, after all of time laboring, that there will be a, a day of rest, an eternity of rest. 
So all of these things are pointing on. We find that instituted here in, in Leviticus 25, but we also find not just a day of rest instituted, but they also had a year of rest, a Sabbath year. It's very interesting uh, that you would have this every week, a day of rest, and then every seven years. Six years, you would go on as usual, but on the seventh year, you'd let the ground rest. You wouldn't plant anything. You wouldn't harvest anything. You'd let it rest. And by the way, scientifically, they say that the land needs that even today. And farmers will tell you, they, they let their fields rest. They'll farm on the land for a certain number of years. Then they won't farm it at all because the, the land needs to be replenished. It's interesting. God knows long before farmers ever knew, God knew. But the year of rest was, was not just about farming it was about reminding people, always reminding people that there is a rest from your labor. There is a deep rest for your soul. We'll come to that in a moment. And the one thing we find here about this year of Jubilee, we find then that there wasn't just a day of rest or a year of rest. There is a rest of rest. It was, a, it was the Jubilee, a Sabbath of Sabbath. Some call it a super Sabbath. Every 49 years, you had a year of Jubilee. Amazing. We're going to talk about that today because we're celebrating the Queen's Jubilee, but it would be good to know where the word came from and what the origin of a real Jubilee is. God instituted it so that at least once, usually, at least once in your lifetime, you would experience a year of Jubilee. Isn't that amazing? Every 50 years. Sometimes you might see two. It might be that when you were, you were born and two or three years later, you came to the year of Jubilee and you lived to be 60 years, and so you got two Jubilees. That'd be really incredible. But God made it in such a way that usually most people, unless, of course, someone died early, most people would experience a year of Jubilee at least once. Now, what made it so special? What made it in such a way that people were rejoicing? We, we've come to identify the name with rejoicing. Uh, Jubilee is jubilation, celebration. What was so special about it, and what does it have to do with us? That's worth knowing, isn't it? What was so special? Look at our text in Leviticus 25, verse number 10. God said, and ye shall hallow or make holy the 50th year. Set the 50th year aside. It's going to be different. Now, would you look here for a moment? One thing I'm beginning to recognize in God's word is that God's word and God's way is a way of separation. I'm beginning to see that God's word, God's way, God's will, if you're going to follow God, it's going to be a life of separation, a life of holiness. We've been looking at that recently, haven't we? The people of God are a holy nation. We should be a holy people. Every once in a while, I meet some, some folks who maybe were raised in a certain tradition or a certain religion, and they'll, in, re, in reference to a religious worker, a clergyman, they'll say, oh, that's a holy man. And, uh, but the truth is, every child of God is a holy, should be a holy person. Literally, that word means you're set apart, you're different. And so the seventh day of the week is a holy day set apart, different from other days. The seventh year is a different day, and the year of Jubilee is a different year altogether. Now, why was it to be set apart? Why was there to be such celebration? Look at the verse, and ye shall hallow the 50th year, and you shall proclaim liberty throughout all the land. Would you look here for a moment? The year of Jubilee was so special because it was a year of declaring all servants, all slaves are free. It's amazing. When you read about the Jewish people, when they entered into the promised land, God divided up under them, under the different tribes, all the land, and the different tribes divided up to different clans, the land. So every family had their own plot of land. But did you know that sometimes... People fell on hard times. And if they fell on hard times and they couldn't pay their bills and, and, uh, and, and they, couldn't, they sold everything they had, and even then, they, after they've sold everything, they still couldn't pay, what they would oftentimes do is they would sell themselves as a servant. They would sell themselves to the one that they owed, and they, say, they would agree with the man that they owed, well, I'll work 30 years for you in order to pay my debt. But the Bible says, the Scriptures teach us, that when the year of Jubilee came, Every person who was a servant, who was a slave, was set free. Can you imagine? That would be a good day for you, wouldn't it? That would be a very good day for you, especially if you'd only just entered into your, your servanthood or your, or your slavery. It would be a very good day for you when the year, knowing that the year of Jubilee is coming and I'm going to be free. 
It was something to look forward to. Every servant would be set free. Marvelous. I can just about imagine how that would cause excitement. But not only that, the scriptures go on. And ye shall proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. By the way, this was only for the nation of Israel, for God's people. This, wasn't, this didn't extend beyond that. This was just for God's people. And it says, it shall be a jubilee unto you, and ye shall return every man unto his possession, and ye shall return every man unto his family. Now, we understand naturally uh, speaking that if, if you owed a lot of debt and you became a servant for that or you were trying to pay that debt off, the year of Jubilee tells us that all debt was canceled. Now, so how many would like to have a year of Jubilee right now? All debt canceled. That would be good, wouldn't it? All, can you imagine? Maybe you just took taken out a mortgage to buy a home. I don't know what it was. And you had accumulated a bunch of debt. On the year of Jubilee, every debt was wiped clean. Amazing. Now, that made the whole nation work on a different economic system. That then made them say, okay, well, well um, uh, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to sell, I'm going to loan this to you at this certain rate, knowing that the year of Jubilee was coming. Or if someone became a servant, they would understand, they would barter, they would buy land. Because as well, we'll find in a moment, not only was debt canceled, it was a year of restoration. So if you lost your land because you fell on hard times, and it was a land of inheritance that you had inherited. By the way, it wasn't yours, it was God's land. But if you lost that land because you fell on hard times, and you had to sell it just to make a living, just to get by, then the scriptures say on the year of Jubilee, your land came back to you. You lost. You got back everything you lost. It was a year of restoration. That's amazing. Everything you lost came back. Every possession, your family. That's what the Bible says there. Return unto every man his possessions, and, and you shall return every man to his family. Meaning, maybe some of your children, you had to, they had to go and work because you couldn't pay your debts, or maybe you had, but everybody got to go home. It's a year of restoration, families restored, inheritance and land restored. I'm telling you, it was, a, it was a year to celebrate. And everything started all over again. Now, here's what that did. That, that kept somebody from becoming a, a, a wealthy tycoon, as it were, a land-owning. It kept, let's imagine our friend Danny, if uh, he, he owned, owned a part of uh, Stand Lake. And then he decided, well, Billy fell on hard times, so he bought, he bought also Minster Level over there. And uh, then as well, uh, Lake Kim was struggling up in High Wycombe, so he bought that. And all of a sudden, uh, Danny became the king of the land. He was owning half of Oxfordshire. But when the year of Jubilee came, sorry, Danny, it all goes back. Now, that also kept someone from being impoverished for the rest of their life, and it kept somebody from thinking that he was God by owning all the land. Now, that means they, they did business accordingly. So therefore, if Danny wanted to buy Billy's land, he knew that there was 20 years until the year of Jubilee They would barter based upon the years until the Jubilee because he'd only have it for 20 years. Does that make sense? It was a year of restoration. But it was also this. It was a year of rest. No work. No planting, no harvesting. You could, you could go out and harvest when you needed it, but you didn't fill up your, your storehouses and your barns. Man, I'm telling you, we'd all like a year of rest, wouldn't we? Can you imagine? A year of rest. Now, what does that have to do with us? That's the real question. By the way, we don't have any, we don't know, but we don't have anything in Scripture, as far as we know, there's no indication that Israel ever actually did this. What does this have to do with us? I'll tell you what it has to do with us. This year of Jubilee, just like everything in the Old Testament, was looking to Jesus Christ. This was looking forward to Christ. What do you mean? I'll tell you. Look here for a second. Luke chapter 4. Turn there with me, please. The Lord Jesus begins his public ministry. He had already been baptized, come up out of the water, 40 days in the wilderness. Now the scriptures tell us in Luke chapter 4, look at it there, beginning in verse number 16. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there is delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. 
He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus stood up and said, this is the year of Jubilee. And he didn't mean a Jewish tradition or ritual. He meant that he was our Jubilee. Our rest, he was, let's go back to these four things we saw. It was a year, think about this, a year of what? A year of liberty, deliverance. Jesus came to set the captive free. You might say, I don't need to be delivered. Every human being is born a sinner. Every one of you, look, you know it. Before you came to Jesus Christ, you were living a wicked, sinful life, and you couldn't change if you wanted to change. You were a slave to sin. How many of you know that to be true? And you maybe tried and couldn't change. You got yourself in such a mess. You were so far in debt. You were in trouble. But Jesus came to say, I have come to preach to you liberty. You're free. Free. It was a year, I mentioned a year of canceling debts. What's that got to do with me? Some of you may be very wealthy. You may be very prosperous. You may not have any debts at all. You may have Ordered your life so well financially that you are very well off. And you might think, I have no debts. But oh, my friend, you have a great debt. You have a debt that you can never pay. Every time you sin, you go deeper in debt. Every time you sin against Almighty God. Boy, your sins are stacking up. The Bible says they're stacking up against you for the day of judgment. Those sins are... Filling up. Can I, would you look this way for a moment? Can you imagine? The scriptures tell us in Revelation that all of your sins have been recorded. And on the day of judgment, the books will be opened. Do you understand that? Can you imagine if today were the day of judgment and they began to open up the books of your life that have everything written in there, every lie you've ever told, every filthy thought that's run through your mind, every time you blasphemed? Every time you lost your cool, every time you were disobedient to, to your parents, every time you were disobedient to the government, all of these things have been recorded and you cannot get away from it. Every time you lied and cheated and swindled and whatever it may be, every, every time you lost your cool, it's all been recorded. Every bit of it, you're in debt and you can't get away from it. Some people have a really silly th thought. They think, well, if I do enough good things, I can outweigh the bad. Now, you just ask a judge in this land if that works. You just, you just, you rock up into court with that mentality. You go stand before the judge in this land after you've robbed the bank. You stand before a judge and say, Judge, look, I know I've robbed the bank, but don't you worry, I've been giving a lot of money to charity. He's going to say, Thank you, Robin Hood, but you're going to jail. I don't care how much good you've done, done if you've done wrong, you have broken God's law and you are in trouble. I am tired of people talking about how good they are. I hear it all the time. I meet people all the time. Oh, but he's a good man. You know, I'm, I'm a good person. I, I speak, we met hundreds in Epsom yesterday, speaking with one young couple, a lovely young couple, and, and the man's wife was doing her absolute best to persuade me and to convince me that her husband was absolutely spotless and perfect. I said, let me shake your hand, sir. First perfect man I've ever met in my life. And uh, maybe she was just doing that so she could buy whatever she wanted to buy at the Epsom stalls there. Uh, but I'm tired of people talking about how good, look, we're not good. And if you think you're good, the Bible says he that, he that says he has no sin deceives himself. You're lying to yourself. You're just adding more. You're sinning even more. Every time you open your mouth and talk about how good you are, you're just sinning even more. You're adding even more debt. You're digging a deeper hole. So stop trying to convince yourself and everybody else of how good you are and bow your knee humbly before God and recognize Jesus came to wipe your debt clean. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all our sin, but people don't want to humble themselves beneath that. This is a year of jubilee because our debts can be canceled because Jesus paid it all. We talked as well as a year of restoration. I love this. Restoration. Do you know in Jesus Christ, we don't, we don't just get back what we lost. We get back what we never had. Amen. It's restored. You, would you look here for a moment? Before you were saved, you didn't have anything. 
anything of spiritual worth or value, of eternal worth or value, anything good at all. So when Jesus saves your soul, he restores unto you what you should have had before man fell into sin in the garden, when Adam and Eve fell, and we also get more. The spirit of the living God moves in, gives unto us the possibility of communing with Jesus moment by moment, day by day. We get the opportunity to serve him. It's restored. A relationship with God which was cut off by sin is restored. Amazing. The year of Jubilee is about restoration. Families can be restored, reunited. Relationships that were broken can be restored. Because of the grace of God, it is a year of restoration. And the Jubilee, Jesus, brings us rest. One of my favorite passages, I know you've heard me say it a million times. Jesus stood up and he said this, come unto me. Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. Rest. Come unto me, Jesus said. All who are laboring, working, trying their best and just can't seem to get it right. And those who are heavy laden, burdened. Jesus said, come unto me and I will give you rest. Jesus is our Sabbath. And some of you this morning need rest for your soul. That's what Jesus said. I'll give you rest. Some of you right now need rest. You're so troubled. You're so upset. You're, so, you're in such a difficult situation. Jesus gives you rest. And so when we think about this year of Jubilee, when we think about this word Jubilee, it is a promise of rest. I love this. Do you know that uh, one of the reasons, that the reason that the nation of Israel could not enter into the promised land? You know what it was? The reason that Israel could not enter into the promised land Unbelief. Unbelief. And the promised land was a picture of entering into rest, ceasing from your labors. The sooner you and I can figure out that the Christian life is not about what you can do, but what about he, it's about what he's done, the sooner we figure that out, the whole lot better you're going to be. The sooner you and I can bow the knee to the fact that this is not about what you can do and how good you are, but this is about how good God is and what Jesus has done, then you can enter into rest. Rest. And you need it. You need it. I love this. One other little thought here back in our text in Leviticus 25. If you'll notice in verse number 9, it says this. Then shalt shalt thou cause the trumpet of Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month in the day of atonement. Do you know what starts the year of Jubilee? Atonement. Look here. Do you know what starts the year of Jubilee in your life? The atonement, the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Do you know what it is that gives you rest? The blood of Christ. Do you know what it is that sets you free? The shed blood of the Savior. The atoning work of Christ. That's what cancels your debt. That's what restores all you've ever lost. The blood of Christ. The day of atonement. It's amazing. This is for us. This is for us. The Bible tells us that there's coming a day when the trumpets shall sound again. It's coming a day when the ram's horn, as it were, shall sound again. We read, it, read about it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and verse number 13. Listen to these words. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. There it is. That trump, that ram's horn that that declared, this is the year of Jubilee. There's coming a day when Christ shall come and we will ultimately enter into that eternal rest. And I'm looking forward to that day. 
that I'm looking forward to the day when I'll no longer struggle with temptation and sin, when I'll no longer have to make a hospital visit, when I'll no longer have to worry about being sick. I'm looking for the day when we won't have to say goodbye anymore. A day when we shall enter into rest will stop working, stop struggling, stop trying, and rest for all eternity with Jesus Christ. That's the promise. The trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I'm looking forward to that day. 1 Corinthians 15, 52 says this, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible is put on incorruption and this mortal is put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass that saying which is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Yeah. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you look here? Do you have jubilee in your heart? Now, what, I want you to look here for a second. If you were alive that day, if you were alive then when they celebrated this year of jubilee, jubilee I think you'd be happy, wouldn't you? I think you'd be rejoicing that you were free, that your debts were canceled, that everything you lost had been restored to you, and that you got a rest for a year. I think you'd be happy. Christian, if you have experienced what it is to be born again, to have your sins washed away, your sin debt canceled, to be set free, to be restored, to have a rest in Christ, you ought to be the happiest man on the planet. You ought to be the most re rejoicing person the world has ever seen. It's a year of jubilee. So why is it that we call ourselves Christians and we look like we're the grumpiest, miserable people on the planet? Come on. If somebody walked up to you today and said, look, I know you owe 200,000 pounds on your mortgage. It's been canceled. Wow. Paid in full. I imagine you'd do a little hop and a skip, wouldn't you? If you were, if you were stuck, you were... You were laboring away. You were a servant to some, some, some other person laboring away. And somebody walked up to you and said, look, you're free. Go away. You're free. Your debt's been canceled. You've been set free. Everything you've ever lost before, let's restore it. I'm going to restore it unto your family. Restore it. Everything you've lost, property, restore it. Inheritance, restore it. I'd say you'd be happy, wouldn't you? If somebody said to you, walked up today, said, you know what I'm going to do for you? I want you to take a year off. Don't work this year. We're going to take care of all your debts, all your, all your expenses. You just rest for a year. I don't know if that'd be such a good thing for me, but I get a little stir crazy. But I'm sure we'd be happy. You're a child of God. You've been set free. Rejoice. You're not bound any longer. Rejoice. You've been restored, so rejoice. Debt has been canceled. You're free. Child of God, let's live like it. And let's tell others that Christ Jesus came to set the captive free. I spoke to somebody, I spoke to somebody yesterday, and they said, my heart is broken. And I looked them in the eyes and said, don't worry, because Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. He came to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. I mean, he came to say, this is the favorable year of God. This is the year of deliverance. This is the year of jubilee. But, do you, know where, do you know where Jesus was quoting from? Luke chapter 4, do you know where he was quoting from? Any of you know? Isaiah 61. Jesus stopped there when he was quoting. Shut the Bible, shut the scroll up. He sat down. But the rest of the passage in Isaiah says this, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That's where Jesus stopped. But do you know what the next thing is? Do you know what comes after the acceptable year of the Lord? The day of vengeance of our God. Amen. Would you look here for a moment? Right now, it's the acceptable year of the Lord. Today is the day of salvation. This is the favorable time. And you need to be saved today. Now. Because 
the day of vengeance. The day of God's wrath and judgment is coming. And if you don't get right with God, if you don't take liberty now, let me ask you a question. Let's imagine today we said, today is the year of Jubilee. Your debts are canceled. You're set free. You get back everything you lost. And not only that, but take a year off. Can you imagine if you continued working as a slave? Can you imagine if you continued working as a slave and, oh, oh, poor me in your chains and, and you, and you didn't, didn't, didn't take any note of it, you didn't believe, and you didn't go back and take the land that was promised back to you, and you didn't rest? You think, what's wrong with you? You're free. Look here, some of you are like that right now. Some of you are like that right now. You will not acknowledge that Christ died for you. You will not acknowledge that you could be free. And so today, I command you, I don't just plead with you, I command you to repent of your sins and believe on Jesus Christ. Trust in Him. I don't beg and plead with you, I tell you, you need to get right with God. I don't need to get on my knees, although if, if I thought that would help, I'd do it. But I'll tell you, this is the day of salvation. So come to Christ now. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we acknowledge thy goodness to us. Oh, what grace that we could be set free. What grace that our debts can be canceled. What grace that we could get back what we've lost and more. And that we can have rest for our souls. Lord, I pray for those in this barn right now who need Christ the most, who need salvation the most. Save them today, Lord. Not tomorrow, not next year, but in mercy, save them today before the day of vengeance of our Lord comes. Have mercy, Lord, I pray. Help us as thy children to rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. For we ask it in Jesus Christ's name and for his sake. Amen.